Okay, welcome to class. Welcome to class. Today we're going to start reminding you that we did the first homework. We did the first homework. The first homework we did. Um, it's got a few uh, poems from the book. Again, make sure you're using the third edition. If your book's not here yet, I've posted all the chapters, um, the, the homework problems from the third edition on Canvas. So go to your files, there's a folder that'll say something like additional reading or something like that. You can find it there. Um, so there's a few there, and then there's three questions from previous tests. That's how, that's the standard for all homework, right? I do that because I don't want anybody to have an advantage by knowing somebody who took the class prior. So I never use a midterm exam twice on a midterm, ever, ever. They become my homework questions, and I've got six years worth plus the previous them. So I try and shake it up and have lots of varieties there. I like this also because it gives you a feel for what a midterm question is going to look like. They're typically three, four, five parts. Um, the pro different aspects will be covered. So this is up, it's due next Wednesday, right? So we've got a week to start on it. Uh, I'd start right away. I definitely wouldn't wait for the night before on these. Okay, let's talk about the reading quizzes. I, I haven't assigned it yet. When I do so, it will show up here in Top Hat, right? So I can assign reading quizzes um, by basically selecting any of these things. And instead of doing a regular sign where we do it in class, I can do I can assign it as a homework or on a custom scale. <laughs> so what this will what how this is gonna work out is every day before class, you have the 24 hours before class to answer a few really basic reading questions. The point is that even if you haven't totally understood the reading, you'll still be able to answer these. Maybe it's like identifying some key vocabulary or something. This is to get you guys through the reading ahead of time. Danny's already posted the reading schedule, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that and already start following along. And the first reading quiz will be for next class, which is the coming Friday. So I think you should get some sort of notification or something. I'll ask on Friday, but it should tell you when I assign things for reading. So we'll find out Friday how that works. And then for in-class questions, we'll practice those today, right? So if you've got your browser up or your app, um, go ahead and grab it and get it ready. And we're going to do our first example of what an in-class question looks like. So up here will pop up a question. You can't answer it yet, I think, by default until I, until I open it up for the question to be answered. Yours should look something like this, right? So this one is, I think, purely for participation points. There's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, there's a right answer. But I will give you points for it. You put in. Right. So if you've got your device, I go ahead and I hit resume. And at this point, you can now submit answers, right? So people, there's 71 people that have signed up for the clicker, which is a low number compared to people in this class. So I'll probably throw this out um, today so that people who haven't gotten devices yet aren't on board. But I want you to get a chance to see how the things work. Question? Where is the join code? The join code is probably this class code, which was 669982. One more time. 669982. 669982, try that. I think that's the same code just for the class in general. Again, I'm not going to count today because I realize not. Like 80 people is not enough people, right? So uh, by Friday, though, we will be for real on this. But this is typically how this is going to work. Get your answers in. I'm going to close the poll in just a second. Yeah. So, okay, so I mean, this, you'll, in class, you'll bring this up and we'll all be able to do a tap that effect, right? Yeah, so you'll be using Top Hat in two different ways. One is for before class reading quizzes, and one is for in class participation. All those points get lumped together and become your in-class participation grade, which is ten percent of your grade. Okay. And will we? Get, I mean, will we know when that's? Is it going to be up from, from when, when will it go up when we can start? Like before class. It'll be up. Well, it'll be up before, before class is due by by class. Time. So yeah. So I will make it an assignment. We're going to test it this Friday for the first time. But I'll have it be up and open the twenty-four hours before class starts. So from right after class would be if it was on Thursday until when class starts on Friday, that's when it will be available to do the reading quiz, right? So before class, you can't show up here and hurry and try and do it. It'll be done while we're closing it before that. Um, maybe even 10 minutes before so I can walk over here, okay? Uh, any questions on this so far? You will be able to see how you did in real time. You can, there should be a, uh, from the class portal, there's a, a way to click um, grade book or something. You'll be able to see in real time how many points you have. Is it my expectation that you get all of your points during the semester? Meaning that, meaning that you get every question right? Definitely not. 
right? Completely not. A lot of questions, my default is I have it half the points for even trying and half the points for getting it correct. But then I'm going to go even further and I'll say, let's say that the highest person that gets the most number of points a semester is 175 points, right? Just to put a number on it. I will make an A be something far less than that, right? I'll say that 100% is actually going to get, say, 140 points, right? So I don't expect you to have, I, I get it, you guys are busy adults, you have lives, marriages happen, you have to go and do things, like you won't always be in class and that's okay. This is just a motivation to be here the vast majority of the time. But if you have to miss a day, don't sweat it, okay? So I'm gonna close the polling. At this point, we can see what the correct answer is. She's clearly yeah. Batman. And I can see what you guys think, which is, oh, that's a great, <laughs> all right, that's pretty good. <laughs> that might be the right answer. All right. Okay, so that's how this works. Any questions on this? If you have issues with Top Hat, I'm going to refer you to the Top Hat people. They have great people that are going to help out. Anybody have an issue? Just raise your hands. Just to, we're not going to adjust, we're not going to deal with it right now. But are there any like outstanding issues? Good. This is good. Clicker, the old clickers I used like every class was like four or five people couldn't get it to work. So this is good. Okay, so. Um, I'll probably move on to, we'll do one other question later in class today. So I'll be hopping between the notes and the browser where that's going. So keep your device handy. Um, we, we'll come back to at least one more time in class today. And in general, there'll be three, four, or five questions on any given day, okay? All right, so let's talk about our learning objectives. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, I went back to the recording of this because I can't stay still. The, the audio gets really muffled, like over here, my computer's not hearing it. So that will be fixed by this Friday. I'm getting a, a little lapel mic that will follow me around, and that should be embedded in with the screen capture, I hope. So we'll try that, so audio recording will get better. Can people hear me okay if I'm talking in this room in the way back, is it good? Okay, good, good. Okay, let's talk about our learning objectives for today. First off, we're gonna learn how to write electron configurations. Well, I guess first off, we'll finish what we did last time, which is finish electron transfers from different levels. When they give off radiation, we'll figure out how to calculate that really quickly. Um, we'll spend the bulk of class today talking about how we relate interatomic forces to real materials properties, things like stiffness, melting point, thermal expansion. Once we understand how things interact with each other as they come close to each other, or as they're pulled away, what those forces look like, we can turn a force into an energy, and once we have an energy, that tells us all sorts of things about a material. Um, if we have time, we'll do an overview of the different types of bonding that exist in materials. And it, I'm doubtful, but if we really have time, we'll actually move to the next chapter, which is already posted. The notes for it are posted online. It's chapter 16, so we're going from 2 to 16. Apologize for the whiplash. It'll be okay. And we'll talk about what enthalpy and entropy are and why in the world we care about these things, okay? So let's start with where we left off last time. Last time we were talking about our friend Rydberg and Bohr, and they came up with this notion that these energy levels exist, right? Electrons don't just exist in a nebulous cloud everywhere. They seem to be confined to certain energy levels, and we know that's the case because this experiment where they took light, which looked like it was white light, but when they split it into the different wavelengths, they weren't just like a big continuous band. Like up here, this one, um, use the pen for what it's for, right? This guy, that's a big continuous band. That's like a bright white light. If I was to burn magnesium or something in front of you or turn on a tungsten light bulb, you see all spectrums of light. They expected that, but when they filtered it out, they didn't see that. They saw discrete bands at certain values. So how do we calculate the energy as an electron hops between these, right? It's really simple. There's a formula that we use. As you hop between levels, the energy is equal to H times C divided by lambda. So H is Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, and then lambda is the wavelength of your light, okay? H, C over lambda, right? In the early days, they were able to calculate the wavelength for hydrogen using this formula. This formula in orange up here is known as the Rydberg formula. It basically said, okay, which energy level is your electron hopping from? It's going from two to one, or from three to one, or from three to two. You basically plugged in one, two, or three, or whatever it has N for the two different states. And if you knew the Rydberg constant for your element, then you could calculate the wavelength. So the problem with this is that this only works for hydrogen. So I'm gonna put like a big warning emoji around that and say, 
warning, hydrogen only. Right? That works really well for hydrogen. It's really not that great for the other elements, right? The other ones, we're going to calculate it directly based off of the energy change. Okay? So the energy change. How do we do this? Let's go to our next clicker question for the day, right? So I'm going to jump over here. I'll get, we're going to work through this together, so don't worry. But it says the following. A green laser pointer has light with a wavelength of 525 nanometers. That's the wavelength, right? So it's a, it's a unit of measure, it's distance. Um, what energy in electron volts would this photon have, right? That single photon of green light, what is the energy it has? We're going to go back over here to our notes, right? And the energy is equal to HC, Planck constant times speed of light, which I'll show you what those are in a moment, divided by that wavelength. So we are given the wavelength. We need to solve for the energy. So this is basic physics stuff. We're going to do that the wavelength is equal to HC um, over, oh, sorry. We want to solve for energy, excuse me. So it's right. So what is HC equal to? H times C, pull out my cheat sheet. Um, if you plug it into Google, it actually knows that HC is a unit of measure. Can I exit out of that? Yeah, I can. If I put in like H times C, sure enough, it's going to give me something that's like, that's technically the correct answer. Planck's constant times the speed of light, that's correct. But those are like nonsense units, right? We want to get units that make sense to us. So the value of this in units that we care about is 1239 electron volts multiplied by nanometers, right? So now, if we plug in 525 nanometers, we're in business. We get the electron volts out of this. So everyone take a chance at this. We're going to go back to our top head. This should still be open in your device, even if it's not showing on the screen here. Um, once I hit to start it, you should see this as something you can answer. So you're going to type in a number. Don't type in any letters. I don't think you need to put in an EB or anything. Just give me a number. And I've got an acceptable range already pre-programmed into it. So, punch this into a calculator. If you forgot a calculator today, grab a friend. I don't care if you work in groups in class, it's fine by me. And get an answer in, we'll just spend a minute or two on this. It's just a one calculation. Anybody have any problem with holding out with this one? But you are, I'm not One more time, it's 1239 electron volt times nanometer, that's H times C in units that are appropriate to the problem. Okay, so go ahead and get your answers in, we'll close this poll in just a minute. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, get your final answers in. So I will pause the poll and let's show the correct value. Correct value should be 2.3616, but I built in a tolerance where if you're even between those two pretty big ranges, it'll give you the correct answer and what happens if I do this? So like 97 people just put in 2.36, great. So people are getting this, right? And that's so close that you would have still gotten credit. So it's okay. Okay, any questions on this? Any straightforward? So if I did it the other way around, if I said an LED, right, that you buy from what used to be Radio Shack, shed a tear to the loss of Radio Shack, right, <laughs> has a, a band gap, which is three electron volts, and the wavelength that comes off of that band gap is equal to that energy, right? So three electron volts, tell me what color of light that is. So to answer that question, you would do what? You would work this in reverse. You plug in three electron volts for your E and you solve for lambda. And then we don't have it here, but you could pull up a 
um, electromagnetic spectrum, which shows you color as a function of wavelength. That's something I would definitely give you on a test. Don't okay. worry, that's something I would give you. Right? I put it right on the test itself. Um, and you can tell me what color it is. Okay? Now, real quick, what should it be? If 2.36 is green and we go to a higher energy, what does that do to wavelength? The shorter wavelength, shorter from green, is that blue or red? It's shorter wavelength is blue. It's shifted, it'll be shifted towards purple and blue. I don't even know if three electron volts is in the, the visible spectrum. It might be. We could look it up, but we won't. Any questions on this? Straightforward stuff, okay? All right, let's talk about... We, so we've already mentioned that this is how EDS works, right? So I'm not going to spend much more time on this other than to say that all you need for EDS to work is a way to knock out an innermost electron, and therefore other electrons are going to fall down because they go down in energy, and they're going to give off radiation. You just have to detect that. So if you have a spectrometer, if you have a tool that can measure this, um, this uh, what comes off as a function of electron volts, right? The energy of the radiation coming off, you can see a bunch of different elements, right? It might be that you have a steel that has six or seven elements in it. You can see these, and if you integrate the area under these peaks, which we're not going to do in this class, you can actually get a quantitative measure of the different elements. So it doesn't just say, like, these six elements are present. No, it says these six are present, and here's the approximate atomic or weight fraction of those. So this is a really powerful tool. If you have a competitor that's making a better, you know, carabiner at Black Diamond, and they want to figure out how they're doing it, a great place to start is EDS. It'll tell you at least what elements are there. Now, it's not the most accurate thing in the world. There's much more accurate ways of determining exactly what elements are there, but it is a very cheap and easy way to do it, okay? You'll see this called EDS, EDX, EDAX. It's all the exact same thing, okay? Okay, we already did that one. 2.36 electron volts, we decided, okay? Now, in the book, it makes a point to, to explain that while Rydberg and those, they saw like distinct lines where electron energy levels were at, in the real world, things aren't exactly occupying that 100% of the time. Like the statistical versus like the wave mechanical model, these are different, right? So if this is your, your atom and you've got like your positively charged nucleus and you've got your electrons occupying the shell out here, what they originally thought is like, okay, 100% of your atoms are located at that distance from the nucleus. But in actuality, it's a probability distribution. It's still pretty tight distribution around that point, but it's not like there's 100% at that point. There's a little bit of distribution, okay? Um, and the wave mechanical model is the correct one, but in order for it to work, you have to have the quantum numbers. And from chemistry, you learned about these, right? There's the principal quantum number, the azimuthal, the magnetic, the spin projection, right? N, L, M sub L, M sub S. Those are our four quantum numbers. So there's a couple of rules that go along with these from chemistry you might, might remember. So somebody remember, what is the rule for n? What can n be? n can be integers. One, two, three, and so forth, right? It cannot be zero. n can be integers starting at one, going upwards, okay? Now L, what can L be? What is L, the azimuthal quantum number, allowed to be? It can be whatever n is minus 1 from 0 up to that value. So it can be 0, 1, 2, all the way up to whatever n is minus 1. It can't. So if your n value is equal to 3, or if that's your principal quantum number, then L can't ever be equal to 3. The most it could be is 2. Okay. Now what about m sub L? What are, what's it allowed to be? What's m sub L allowed to be? Anybody remember this from chemistry? I, what's funny is like we learned this, it's like one of the first things we learned in chemistry, but because they don't connect it to something that is useful, we delete it. And so I'm going to try and connect it to something useful real quick here. But what can it be? Do you remember? Is, this, is that the wrong word? It's negative. Yeah. That can be negative L, and then it can be negative L. Oh, gosh. Sometimes EndNote does things that make me sad. It'll do that. Is it going to stay? I don't quite know what's happening. but right, And then all the way up to... Uh, L minus 1 up to positive L, right? So if L is equal to 2, right, then M sub L can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. You remember this from chemistry. And then what can M sub S be, our spin quantum number? Yeah, it can be either negative 1 half or positive 1 half, which we call spin up or spin down, right? 
So what do these things actually do for us? Well, let's start with n equals 1. If our principal quantum number equals 1, then that tells us our shell designation. We call this the K shell. It's just the, 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 the name they give it. Doesn't matter if you don't remember that, right? The subshells that that can be, we call the S shell, right? Um, how many orbitals can exist in the S shell? It can have two, right? So it can have, sorry, one orbital, excuse me, one orbital in the S shell, we'll, we'll explain why in just a second. And how many electrons per subshell? That's where two. So why is it this value of one for the orbital, right? That comes from right here, right? If n equals one, what can our values of L be? Only zero, right? Because it can go up to n minus one, and if one is equal to n, then we only have one value for L, it's just zero. So that's the only subshell we get, we just get one of those. The value of zero is the, is the subshell. And then per each subshell, you can put electron up or electron down. You can't do two ups or two downs or anything else. You can do one up, one down, or one of each. Those are your options. So a maximum of two electrons. Therefore, in this shell, the principal quantum number equal to one, which we call the K shell, you can fit a grand total of two electrons, right? Nothing too fancy there. Let's go a little bit harder. Now, if n equals two, now what can L be? What two values can L be? Zero and one, right? So now we've got two different subshells. So we give those different names. We call the one the S, and one the p. This might start to sound a little bit familiar, right? When n is equal to three, now we can have three of these things, right? We can do s, p, and then the d orbital, right? So these, these shells start forming. Now how many of these are in each one? In the s it's the same as before, it's still just one, still one. But for the p subshell, now l equals one, what can m sub l equal? If l is one, what can m sub l be? Minus one? zero, positive one. So it's got three, right? It's got three what we're calling um, orbitals in that shell. Does this make sense? If, if you remember like your periodic table, this should be looking kind of familiar, right? If we go to our periodic table, my personal favorite right here, this would be like the 2s orbital, lithium and beryllium, but then the 2p has one, two, three, four, five, six elements that can occupy the 2p orbital. That's because it's got three orbitals and you can fit two per subshell, right? So you can actually get six plus two, right? So by the time that we finish our quantum number equal two, we can get two from the first quantum number equals one, and we can get eight more from the second quantum number. Well, how many is that? Does that make sense? Well, one, two, that's hydrogen and helium. That's our first quantum number equals n equals one. Here's n equals two in our S subshell. That's two more, and then six more. So that's sure enough, that's 10. That's 10 different species that we can have, okay? And then we just keep on going. So it's gonna be the same as before, one and three for our zero and one L value. And now, since this is equal to three, L can be zero, one, and two. So if L is equal to two, what are our M sub L values? Negative two all the way to positive two in integer values. So negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. That's five different values. So there's five orbitals in the D subshell, right? So we can, just like before, we can fit a, a there's always two per subshell. Oh, sorry, I did that wrong. I wrote that incorrectly, this is six. We'll do for the per shell. It's eight, six, two, six, 10. So you add those up, that's 18. And you could just keep on going, right? That's why these things actually matter, because when you understand that the, the, uh, the the quantum, the wave mechanical nature and the quantum numbers that have to be associated with elements, it makes sense why the periodic table is the goofy shape that it's in and why elements of certain numbers have the same properties with one another, okay? So we'll have a chance to calculate the, um, what these specific n, l, m sub l, and m sub s values would be for elements in a moment, okay? Um, I'm gonna, Let's say let's do this group activity. First off, it says, how does the energy change for these shells and subshells? Does it go up or go down? So as you start with a quantum number of one and you move towards quantum number of four, is that going up or down in energy? Yeah, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you've got more and more electrons. As you move down this table, you're going to higher quantum numbers. There's more and more electrons. And those are gonna be your higher energy states, right? Hydrogen, it could technically fill one of those states. Like it's single electron, 
It could be promoted to some really high energy level, but it doesn't want to. It's going to occupy the lowest energy level, which is the closest one first, right? So they go up in energy as you move away um, towards higher in quantum numbers, right? What else do we know? Um, how are these discrete states occupied? Let's say that you're in the D orbital, the D shell, we should call it. The D shell has five orbitals, right? So if you're an electron that's going to occupy these five states, how do you want to occupy it? We said it last time. We said that they like to be filled, half filled, or completely empty. I know they'll do other things, but if it has the option, that's what it likes. Filled, half filled, or empty, right? Right, those are what it would like to be. That's gonna help us write out our electron configuration. So let's do that. Let's start with oxygen. So let's go back to our periodic table. Oxygen is number eight up there. If I ask you to write out the electron configuration, what I'm really asking you to write out is what electron states are filled all the way up to oxygen. So how's that work? Clearly like the 1s1 and the 1s2. So both of the available electrons that can fit in the 1s orbital are gonna be filled. So 1s2, it's gonna have both of those. 1s2, meaning it's filled its 1s um, subshell, okay? Now it moves to the 2s. The 2s means printable quantum number is two, and now we're in the s subshell, and it's gonna fill both of those. That's lithium and beryllium, it'll fill those up. So 1s2, 2s2, and then oxygen exists in the p subshell, the 2p subshell. Does it completely fill it? No, it's got one, two, three, four of those. So it's gonna be two P4. I'm, this shouldn't be the first time you're seeing this, right? And then there's an easier way to write these things. Let's say we're doing um, potassium there. If we're doing potassium, which is number 19 down here, you don't have to write out 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. You could, that's perfectly valid. But you can do a shortcut. You can say whatever argon is, the last noble gas before it, plus 4s1, right? So a perfectly valid way to write this would be argon in square brackets, meaning whatever argon is, and then you're going to add to that 4s1. It's got one electron in that four, principal quantum number four, and then the s subshell. Okay, any questions on this so far? Can I answer any questions on this? I think this is something you've seen before and should be familiar. Okay, so I'm not going to belabor this because it's not the most critical thing in the world. Um, what is more interesting is how this relates to bonding, which is the point of today's lecture is bonding, right? So this becomes really useful because we remember our rules. Electrons, if they had their way, they would be filled, half filled, or empty, right? So let's look at potassium, right? We just saw potassium here. It looks just like a noble gas, argon, but it's got one extra electron, right? And we know that noble gases are very stable. It's a very stable state. That they, they exemplify the rule of filled, half-filled, right? Its p orbital is completely filled, and then the next one above it is completely empty. Great, it's where it wants to be. Potassium could be that way if only, if only what? If it gets rid of that electron. So it's no surprise at all whatsoever that the most common oxidation state, and I'm sure the only oxidation state of potassium, is plus one, meaning it lost an electron and it became positive to a plus one, right? Because if it gets rid of that electron, it looks like argon with an extra neutron or two, right? That's pretty great, it's happy in that state, okay? Even though it's now in a, it's positively charged, okay? So it, it removes its electron really easily. And we can see that if we go back to our, um, right here, this was our ionization energies, which again is a measure of how much energy does it take to strip away the outermost electron. Where's potassium on here? Potassium's right here. So does it take a lot of energy? No way, it takes barely any. Less than five electron volts and you can steal that electron because it didn't really like it that much to begin with, right? It didn't really want it there. I mean, it kind of did because it has 18 protons in the nucleus and so 18 electrons is balanced. When you steal one away, now it has a charge. So it does cost some energy but what if you tried to steal argon's electron? Argon has a totally filled P shell. It's in a happy place. If you rip that guy away, it takes three times the energy of potassium, right? This is why argon doesn't form compounds because it doesn't want to give up or take any electrons. It's happy, right? 
Potassium can't wait to get rid of it. It's really easy to, for it to give up. That's why it forms compounds really easily, okay? So these, learning how to write these um, electronic configurations helps give you some insight into whether things are going to bond. And if they do form bonds, what oxidation state are they gonna be in? Are they gonna accept electrons? Are they gonna give them away? Are they going to give away two or three or vice versa? They can tell us this, right? So just looking at the periodic table, if you had to guess the oxidation state for fluorine, what would you guess? Fluorine's up here, it's number nine. It's gonna pick up an electron to become minus one because then it's gonna look like neon and be delighted, right? It'll be super happy, right? Meanwhile, what about silicon? What do you think the common oxidation state for silicon is? Silicon, maybe turn to a neighbor and tell me what you think. Okay, what do we think? Silicon, silicon's in a funny spot. What will it do? Does anybody feel brave? Okay, what do you think? Yeah, so is it halfway filled? Um, in the P shell, there's six seats available and it has electrons in two of them. Oh, I was thinking that. So if it gathered one more, there would be some stabilization for it to actually become one negative. That's not a common state of silicon, but there's something better can do. What does silicon typically do? Anybody know? Almost always, it shares for one thing. We'll talk about covalent versus ionic in just a moment. But it typically, since it's got the two in the P and two more in the S, it's got four electrons that it would get rid of. But in order to get all the way to the argon, it would have to pick up four electrons. So it's it's not really sure. It's like I can gain four electrons. I can get four, get rid of four electrons. It can kind of go either way. It's more common for it to get rid of four electrons and look like helium. That's more. Oh, sorry. Look like neon. Excuse me. Right. That's more common. Okay. What about aluminum oxide? Right. If we looked at aluminum oxide. What do you think the chemical formula would be of aluminum oxide? I don't even know. I thought of this. Well, take a look at your periodic table. Where's aluminum and where's oxygen? What do you think oxygen wants to do? Oxygen probably wants to pick up two electrons to look like neon. So it's probably going to be oxygen two minus. What about aluminum? It's probably going to get rid of three electrons, right? In fact, that's the only thing it's going to do. So you've got a plus three ion, aluminum, that's going to react with a minus two ion, oxygen. How's that going to work? Plus three does not equal minus two, so what will the formula have to be? Two aluminums, three oxygens. And sure enough, that is the chemical formula, Al2O3 of aluminum oxide, right? So the, even though these are basic, simple rules, they really help us have some intuitive understanding of what things form when reactions occur, which will be really important for the rest of the semester, right? Um, now, some cases, you can have a compound where there's not a single oxidation state. Um, take iron oxide. First off, iron, where's iron at? Iron's right here in the middle of our D subshell. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six of the available 10 seats in that D subshell. So it could get rid of one electron and become iron plus one, and it would half fill its shell. That's an option. What else could it do? It could leave its, its shells here and get rid of the four S2 electrons. It could get rid of the, cal the, the potassium and the calcium electrons. So it could become a plus two, or it could get rid of those two plus this one and have this thing half filled in a plus three state. All of these are options for iron. That's why this is actually found in lots of different places because it can bond in lots of different ways. You can get rid of one, two, or three. Two or three is the most common, right? And so the different forms of iron oxide, which we call rust, represent this flexibility. You can have it plus two. If iron gets rid of two electrons, then it bonds with oxygen to form FeO, right? Which we call wustite. It's a type of iron oxide. If it gets rid of three electrons, it forms Fe2O3, which we call, I think that one's hematite. Is that an 
I'm mixing it up. Yeah, that's hematite. Fe2O3, right, where it's plus three, so you have to have the same ratio as alumina oxide. That's hematite. That's the red rust that we're used to seeing on stuff. And it can even have a mixture. Some of the iron might get rid of two, some of it might get rid of three. So you've got a mixture of plus two and plus three, and that forms magnetite. This was the very first compass material. Like cavemen, like whoever was the first one to come with a magnet, they used naturally occurring mineral Fe304 because it's magnetic. We're not gonna talk about why that is in this class, but it's interesting. Um, this thing, it's got four oxygens, so if you took minus two, the charge of oxygen, times four, there's a total negative charge of negative eight. And you've got three ions to add up to, to positive eight in order for this thing to be balanced. How does it do that? It has two of these are three plus, one of them is two plus. So three plus three plus six, you get positive eight. So you can have compounds where there's mixed oxidation states, which will be important, okay? Any questions so far? If I gave you, if I asked you on a test, what is the probable Oxi the compound formula for niobium oxide, what would you say? What's the probable formula of niobium oxide? Turn to a neighbor. Okay, what do we think? We're gonna hold the audience here. Who, who wants to go break? Who thinks that? And there's no one answer. There's a more common one, but you could come from a couple answers here. What do you think it is? That is the most common form. NB205. What for that to work, how does it have to work? Niobium gets rid of all five of its outermost electrons. It gets rid of all five so that it looks like krypton, right? That's just what this one likes to do. It forms in other states, that's the most common one. If it now is plus five, you have a plus five ion reacting with a minus two ion, the way to make that work is two niobiums for every five oxygens, Nb2O5, okay? Any questions on this? If you turned in, what if you said like, oh, I thought it would have gotten rid of just two, and it was just NbO, that also exists, right? So you just over time develop an intuition for which one's like to get rid of what number. I don't expect you to know those ahead of time, so I would have graded those both the, both correct if I put it on a test, and I won't do that on a test. I'll, I'll do ones that are easy, okay? Let's keep going. Let's talk about why do bonds form in the first place, right? Um, the answer to this, and the answer to really anything in this class if you don't know the actual answer is, because it lowers the energy, right? So just take note of that, and on your final, if you come across a question you know the answer to, it lowers the energy, that's why, right? That's why everything in the entire universe happens, because when it happens, the overall energy, and energy is this nebulous term we're using, we're gonna define it next chapter, but the energy goes down. If things can go down in energy, it's happy. So bonds are no different. Imagine this, you've got two oxygens. We know the oxygen in the air that we breathe is not single oxygens, it's two oxygens stuck together. That's what we breathe. That's where our body splits that bond and does whatever it does with oxygen, right? But why did it exist as a bond in the first place, oxygen and oxygen? We can understand it from bonding, right? So imagine oxygen number one. How many electrons does oxygen have? It's got eight electrons, okay? So let's start filling in our electrons here, right? It's got two in the 1s, right? One, two, three, four. And then here we can have five, six, seven. It's gonna wanna fill it first half full. It, Cause electrons, electrons are just like people get on a bus, right? If you're gonna get on a bus and there's like five people on there, are you gonna be the dude that's like, what's up? You're gonna sit <laughs> on your sandwich here uncomfortably close, right? No one does that. And electrons don't do that. They don't partner up and they don't have to. They're gonna first spread out. And when every seat's got one in it, only then do they typically start pairing up unless something weird's happening. And that's not in this class. So that won't happen in this class, right? So we got one more electron, then he pairs. And he goes spin down because we can't have two spin ups or spin downs in the same orbital. That violates Pauli exclusion principle, right? So there's our eight electrons. The same thing with this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just like that, okay? Now when these things come together, bonds 
Well, the, the two atoms either share electrons or they don't make electrons. We'll talk about the differences in just a moment. But in this case, they're going to share them. And so you see a hybridization of the orbitals, right? So these same four electrons go one, two, three, four to fill in this new bonded one, where two of these orbitals are lower than they were before, and two of these are a little bit higher. But on average, it's the same. So no net benefit here. This doesn't make your life better. Let's go to the next one. Same thing, two a little bit lower, two a little bit higher, no benefit, right? But it changes here. Of those six total orbitals, three from each one, the bonding that forms creates this funky new shape, right? That is unusual. And what that unusual new shape allows us to do is fill it in a way that lowers energy. We've got six electrons, no, sorry, eight electrons we need to put in here. We're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Overall, we put six electrons lower than they were before and only two higher than they were before. So overall, we went down in energy. This is why oxygen bonds with oxygen to form the, 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 the molecule that we breathe, okay? You won't have to draw things like this in this class. This is just to illustrate why bonds form. Okay, what you do need to understand is this. Okay, we've got 10 minutes left. We'll get as far as we can. Bonds exist because they are the result of attractive and repulsive forces. If I've got two atoms, say two, uh, let's not do oxygen and oxygen because it's not quite obvious why they react. Let's think of something really easy. Let's say salt, sodium chloride. If we go back to our periodic table, sodium is going to be plus one. It's going to want to get rid of that electron. And chlorine is going to be minus one because it really wants to pick up one more. Once these things donate their electrons and accept the electron, they now become positively and negatively charged. So you've got sodium plus chlorine minus. What do we know about positive and negative? They attract. What is the expression for attraction? Who's taking physics that remembers Coulombic attraction? What is it? What's the expression? Force is equal to what? Well, yep. It's a, I'm going to just call that K. K is the, is the 1 over 4 pi. It's a constant. Multiplied by the charge of these two things, charge of 1 and the charge of 2, Q1 and Q2, multiplied or divided by the distance between them squared, right? So if you've got two charged particles, as you separate them, the further you separate them, the force really falls off. It falls off as the square, right? So what this looks like, if we were to plot force over here, versus interatomic separation, R, the distance between these two things, the attractive force looks something like that. This is approximately 1 over R squared, right? So the, what, what that means is the closer and closer I bring things together, the greater the attractive force for them to come together. So the question, the obvious question we should ask is, why don't they just keep on getting closer, right? Because if they get close and there's an attractive force, and the closer they get, there's a larger attractive force, then there's just a, a driving force that is unstopped, right, unparalleled, that's going to make these things just collapse into each other, and the galaxy becomes a lump of atoms, right? So that doesn't happen. So why don't they just collapse infinitely together? What do you think? That's one good guess. Maybe that the neutrons, right, which are positively charged, when they get close enough, start to interact with each other. That's not it. It's a great guess. Or energy. <laughs> energy. It has to do with energy, <laughs> right? Let's go back over here. When two atoms get close to each other and form a bond, those electrons still have to occupy states, right? And as it turns out, as you as you bring them closer and closer together. If electrons are occupying the same volume of space, they cannot occupy the same energy levels. That's the Pauli exclusion principle, right? So instead, you have to start inventing more and more levels up here, higher and higher, and you have to start cramming electrons up there the, cl the closer you get them together, and that becomes extremely repulsive, right? So there's two forces. There's an attractive and a repulsive force. And basically, the repulsive force is really strong when it's close, right? This one is much sharper than like an R squared, but it falls off, right? So if you were to add the attractive and the repulsive uh, terms together, what do you end up with? You end up with this. It's gonna be at, at really close values, 
there's going to be a net repulsion. So if you bring atoms really, really close together, they're going to want to separate because there's a net repulsion. But there will be a point. Um, let's see. I always draw this thing wrong. I do it on the wrong side. Like so. Uh, I messed that up. One more time. Drawing. Where it'll look like that. So here's our net force. What this means is that there is a point in space, right, in separation between these two things, where there is no net force acting on it, right? That guy, right there. We can label it. We can give it a name. We call that R naught. R naught. That's the bond distance. When sodium and chlorine bond, that's the bond distance because that's the point where there's no net force. If you bring them closer, then the repulsive force takes over, right? If you bring them further apart, then the attractive force takes over and pushes them back together, right? So you can think of any bond as a combination of the attractive and the repulsive forces, okay? Any questions? Yeah, Colby? No, there's not. Good question. But R naught does change when you change other values. For example, what do you think? Well, hold that thought. We'll come back to that. R naught can be changed. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, right here. Right. Remember your name? Ashley. Ashley. Um, kind of it's not an electrochemical it's not electrostatic I mean it doesn't have to do with negative negative it has to do with this when we talk about the different orbitals that are out there they occupy a volume of space right so like if your n number is six and your quantum numbers are such and such these are your orbitals so if you got two atoms that both have all this going on and you occupy the same volume of space you cannot have electrons occupying the same volume of space for two different atoms that would violate Pauli exclusion principle so instead it starts to occupy higher and higher and higher energy levels, and that becomes really expensive from an energy standpoint. So sometimes they call this the hard sphere model. You can treat atoms kind of like hard spheres, like little glass marbles. They get together to a point, but then it's like, man, you really can't bring them closer together. It's too energetically expensive. Okay, other questions? Um, so when you're calculating force, it's really important to remember that net force is when you get um, F net, that is equal to the attractive force, attractive plus the repulsive force. And it, when it is equal to zero, if F net is equal to zero, then R is equal to R naught, right? We have our equilibrium bond distance, okay? That's our first important thing to remember. Now, we only have a minute or two left in class, but if we want to turn this into energy, which we're going to do, how do you go from a force to an energy? Anybody remember how to do this? Energy is equal to the integral of force with respect to the distance along which that force is acting. So in this case, that's the interatomic separation, it's dr. So when we start class next time, we will spend probably the first 10 minutes wrapping this up, relating this to materials properties. But as surprising, as simple as this is, just from thinking about forces, we're going to be able to get all sorts of properties like melting point, coefficient of thermal expansion, um, stiffness, all sorts of things. So we'll pick up there next time.